Hi there, I'm Wazza and this is Bike File, the show that gives you all the information you need about the best bikes on the market. Now in today's episode we're going to be dealing with some bikes that are rather hard to pigeonhole. The only thing they've got in common is they've all got a lot of character. So without further ado, let's get to it with some alternative motorcycles. And in this alternative smorgasbord this week I'll be testing a Buell Lightning, a Harley Dyna Superglide and a BMW R1200C. Louise will be out on a Harley Dyna Lowrider and Rob will be getting out and having some fun on a KTM LC4. Having gone to town and created themselves a brand new sports bike for their range in the shape of the Firebolt, the chaps at Buell probably took themselves away to the nearest boozer for a few drinks to congratulate themselves on a job well done. After all, they'd come up with the most powerful Harley based motor yet, wrapped it up in a brand new chassis and topped the whole thing off with a host of innovations that have won them the adoration of an expectant waiting world. However, for all this cleverness, the Firebolt was always going to be a niche motorcycle. That motor may have plenty of power, but it's still fairly old fashioned, and those looks aren't always going to be everyone's cup of tea. So, Buell needed another bike to complement it in the lineup, and that was that. The answer they came up with was this the Lightning. It may look very different to the Firebolt, and it may have a completely different name, but the motorcycle you're getting here is no more than a Firebolt with flat bars a weenie bikini fairing, some rather strange looking headlights and a seat unit so short your chances of taking any pillion further than the end of the road are very unlikely indeed. But the main question has to be, is it any good? Yes is the simple answer. Unsurprisingly the Lightning shares a number of characteristics with its Firebolt cousin, the most obvious of which is its size. This is a small motorcycle. From the top it is narrow, from the side it is short and from the pillion seat it barely exists. All this means that once you're on board the Lightning you have got stacks of control through these nice high and wide bars up at the front and you can chuck this bike about just about as hard as you dare. To be honest, the last thing I rode that steered this quickly was an Aprilia RS250. The steering is absolutely lightning quick, um, no pun intended. Anyway, this nimble nature makes this bike a complete winner down any back roads you care to mention and also could make it a demon in town if it wasn't for that gearbox. But then the Lightning is no mainstream machine. That's not what it's all about. And once you've tuned into these idiosyncrasies, they all add to the character and charm of the bike. Braking, as on the Firebolt, is looked after by that vast single rim mounted disc up front and really is pretty darn good indeed. But as far as even the most exuberant road riding goes, the braking setup at the front is sharp, clean and plenty powerful enough, thank you very much. All in all, I'd take a Lightning over a Firebolt any day of the week. Where the Firebolt wants to be a sports bike but doesn't quite make it because of that motor, the Lightning makes far more sense. There's plenty of performance and handling for loads of road jollies and is absolutely bubbling over with character. It's maybe not the best everyday bike, but for a rider who wants something a little bit different for the weekend, it could be just about perfect. So let's have a look at the scores. Styling, 8 out of 10. Very sleek, very compact and all in all a very unique looking machine. Comfort, 7 out of 10. Within the usual constraints of naked bikes not being very comfortable at speed due to the wind blast, this is a very nice place to spend some time and put some miles on. Performance. 8 out of 10. The motor and the chassis are very well mated and you can have a real giggle on this bike. Street cred, 7 out of 10. Particularly in the yellow it's definitely a head turner and get some loud pipes on it, you're only going to turn a few more. Reliability, bit of a sticky one this but we're going to go with a 6 out of 10. These bikes really do seem pretty good given the last year that they've been out on the market but the history of Buell is not the greatest given that just 4 or 5 years ago they had to recall every model they'd ever made. Value for money, 6 out of 10. It's not the most expensive bike out there, but for the niche machine that it is, it's still a fair amount of money to part with. So that's the Buell Lightning, but if you fancy your bikes a little bit bigger, don't worry because later in the show, I'm going to be on BMW's throbbing R1200C. But before we get there, here's Louise on a Harley Dyna Lowrider. Thanks, Wazza. And now for something a little heavier. Custom bikes. Well, it's the only bike category out there where size matters. The bigger, the better. But then again, they do originate in the good old US of A where size means everything. 
Take Harley Davidson, for example. They have a whole range of bikes, and this is a fine example. It's the Dyna Lowrider, and this bike weighs in at a hefty 300 kilos. Now, you really wouldn't want to get the side stand wrong on that, would you? Especially outside the wine bar on a sunny afternoon. The bike, like the rest of the Harley range, is powered by the newish Evo motor. We say newish because even though it's three years old now, in Harley's eyes, its life has barely begun and will probably remain largely unchanged for the next 30. Technology? Well, who cares about that? You don't buy a Harley for its modern advances. You buy it because it's a Harley. It's the name, the lifestyle, the dream. You know, sun on your face and wind in your hair. And when you've learned to live with that, you can put up with the bike's inadequacies. And you may even grow to love it, especially if you like being looked at. Jump aboard the lowrider and you're immediately aware of how the bike got its name. You see, I can get both my feet planted firmly on the terra firma, and that really makes a refreshing change. Now, we know what Harleys are all about, so let's fire up that huge 1450cc engine. And those two pistons are moving up and down in what appears to be slow motion, but it sounds the biz, and it feels like there's an earthquake about to take place. This motor is as understressed as they come, yet in spite of its thunderous proportions, the feeling in the saddle is somewhat smooth and refined, thanks to the two-point rubber isolation mounting system that soaks up the engine vibrations before they reach the rider. The gearbox is solidly mated behind the engine, adding to the rigidity of the Dynaglide frame. Let's face it, this bike needs all the rigidity it can muster, not to improve performance so much as to simply stop it from folding in half. Well, there's no getting away from the fact that Harleys are as popular now as they always have been, and 2003 is a special year for them as they celebrate 100 years of bikes in the making. So if you are thinking of treating yourself to one, I suggest you get your name down on that waiting list as this model wears the centenary badge to make you feel that little bit more special. And we should now see how it measures up with our scores on the doors. Performance, the bike is halfway there, earning itself 5 out of 10. It's hardly awe-inspiring, but the lowrider can be used for little more than cruising, with its 68 brake horsepower at 5,400 RPM, and of course it weighs in pretty heavily. As for comfort, well taller riders will find the bike akin to lying in bed. Only the V-twin throb will prevent you from sleeping, and it turns itself 7 out of 10. As for the build, Harleys always score quite high there. The low rider may well weigh as much as a tank, but fortunately for us, it's built like one too. You could keep this bike forever and it would never miss a beat or perish. 8 out of 10. And as for value for money, well I give it 6 out of 10. It's priced at around £11,800 and for that there's no real technology. And as for street cred, the low rider earns itself 7 out of 10. It appeals to a far wider audience than, say, a sportster. It's considered a proper Harley, but it still remains solely the machine of choice for the older generations or those Hell's Angel wannabes. And now it's time to go back to Wazza. Let's see what he's up to. I'm going to polish my chrome. Welcome to Hog Heaven with this Harley Davidson's Dyna Superglide, one of the cheapest ways into a proper slice of the American dream. Obviously this is cheap by Harley standards, so you'll still need to stump up the thick end of nine grand for one of these, but in the Harley lineup, this is an entry level machine. Performance may be largely irrelevant with a mere 68 bhp on tap and 279 kilos of shiny bulk to cart around, but don't be fooled, this bike can still make you feel very special. Comfort on the Dyna Superglide is very good within the constraints of never visiting the far side of 70 mile an hour and always travelling alone. As with most Harleys, apart from the electric glides, pillion accommodation is minimal to say the least. And while this seems not to bother bikini clad butt shaking fillies in the USA if Daytona Bike Week's anything to go by, even the hardiest of English roses is going to be pretty fed up if you introduce two up touring into the agenda. The gearbox still feels more closely related to your average piece of farm machinery than most modern motorcycles, but then what's your hurry? 
styling, 8 out of 10. Not the best looking Harley ever, but very cool and very traditional. Performance, 5 out of 10. It's a Harley. If you really want performance, look elsewhere. Comfort, 7 out of 10. Fine as long as you're on your own and not in a hurry to get anywhere. Reliability, 6 out of 10. Harleys are a lot more reliable than they used to be, but you'll still need to be a dab hand with the cleaning gear if you want to keep it in good nick. Street cred, 10 out of 10. Who cares what other riders think? To Joe Public, nothing is cooler than a Harley. Value for money, 8 out of 10. Nine and a half grand is a lot of money for a bike this slow, but then it is the real thing and resale values on Harleys are stronger than on any other motorcycle. Well, out of the bikes we've seen so far, I'd have to say I would take the Lightning, simply because it is a complete giggle. But that is the end of part one, but do join us again in part two, when Rod will be out on a KTM LC4, and Louise will have a stash of handy buying information for you. See you then. Hi there, and welcome back to Bike File with me, Wazza. Now, in this show, we're looking at alternative bikes. So, shortly, I'm going to be out on BMW's R1200C, but before we get there, here's Rod with the KTM LC4. Now, I thought I knew the road bike market pretty well. I've even managed to keep up to the current crop of supermotos and can tell my Mastiffs from my CCMs. But this 625cc LC4 took me completely by surprise and has crept into the supermoto market straight from the off-road competition department at KTM. If you thought KTM 640 Duke was a pretty radical bike, the LC4 may surprise you too. Developed straight from the Paris-Dakar factory enduro bikes, the LC4 range includes several variants, some of which even come with pillion footrests in a pretense at accommodating a passenger. But make no mistake, the LC4 is a pure off-roader and much more at home on a track. Buying one for serious road use will instantly brand you as a nutter, and quite deservedly so. The 625cc water-cooled single is designed for hard work and kicks out a claimed 49.3 brake horsepower at 7,250 rpm. In fact, it's suspiciously similar looking to the power unit in the 640 Duke and the LC4 gives you the option of an electric starter. Very handy if you are stranded with a stalled engine in four feet of mud, or if the weird left-hand kickstarter simply proves too much to bear. Big fat tyres on 17-inch wire-spoked wheels keep you in touch with the ground, albeit not necessarily all the time. That huge twin-pot single disc brake says stop it all over it, and underlines the LC4's role as a hooligan bike par excellence. While the 640 Duke is the bike most people would recognise as KTM's high-profile supermoto, the LC4 actually predates it and started life as a 400 back in the early 90s before growing in stages to its current size of 625cc. In fact, the LC4 is almost a grand cheaper than the Duke, coming as it does with the cheaper wire spoke wheel option and a little less radical styling. If you're thinking of dipping a toe into the supermoto market, one of these could be the smart buy. KTM have been in the off-road game for quite some time and know how to make a bike take some punishment. The LC4 may only weigh 139 kilograms, but it's surprisingly sturdy and will take the hard knocks most owners will dole out. If you're thinking of venturing into supermotos or are looking for a serious alternative to satisfy the weekend hooligan in you, give this a try. Nice as the LC4 is, I have to say that this is not really my kind of bike. My own version of weekend hooliganism usually involves drinking too much in a muddy field rather than pulling wheelies up the high street. But if you are bristling with excess testosterone and have a hankering to drift sideways around bends on the way to the shops, take a look at this bike, you might just like it. And now to the scores on the doors. For its size, the KTM has performance aplenty and the bike's light weight makes for a thrilling, adrenaline pumping ride. The handling takes a bit of getting used to if you've only ridden road bikes, but once you get the feel of it, the bike is responsive enough to let you explore the edge of the envelope if you have the bottle. Wheelies and stoppies galore for the brave, seven for performance. Comfort wise, forget it. This is not a bike to sit on and cruise. In fact, it's barely a bike to sit on at all. The seat is there to give you somewhere to pause on the rare occasions you have both wheels on the ground, 
and affords the comfort of a plank edge. One out of ten for comfort. But if that puts you off, you're missing the point. So is it reliable? Well, it does look well built and it should be durable enough. But I have a horrible suspicion that crash damage may get to these bikes before entropy has had a chance. I'll guess it's 7 out of 10 for reliability, if the bike survives long enough. And street cred? Those in the know will spot this bike as a serious contender rather than just another trailer. But it lacks the aggressive street style of the same factory 640 Duke, and has an entry level feel about it that mutes the effect. On the other hand, it's an obvious nutter tool, so on balance I'll give it 5 out of 10 for street cred. And now! Enough of this off-road malarkey, here's Wazza! Well, if any of the bikes on the show so far today take your fancy, here's Louise with all the handy buying information you could need from the men who know. If you want a bike that's a bit different and you don't fancy a dodgy European brand, then why not look to the land of the free and the overweight? American bikes certainly are different. Predominantly cruisers suited to the long straight freeways with the butch looking Buell thrown in for good measure. But do you really want a brash American? One of the big advantages of American motorcycles is that they are extremely good value for money. Although on the face of it they may look expensive, they're not. Because the overall ownership benefits of American motorcycles are absolutely superb. They stand out in a crowd because everybody has the impression of easy rider. They all think about the film and the music, and that just cuts it completely from a sports bike market. To the non-biking public, and too many bikers for that matter, American bikes mean Harley Davidson. But now Victory, Boss Hoss and others are competing with the mighty Harley Davidson and giving the Yanks a bit of variety, although they do all look quite Harley-esque. If you do want the mix of sports bike and street fighter performance, then the Buell is just waiting for you to discover it. And believe me, it corners like a pro. Performance of American motorcycles has never really been associated with speed. The performance factor is the ability of the motorcycle to carry people and luggage across country with a relative degree of comfort, um, which all American cycles do extremely well. Well, if you like having your feet and arms forward greeting the horizon, then I suppose you'll find these bikes comfy. Depends on what you're used to, really. The Buell is another kettle of fish. It's tall and hunched and might be comfy if you're Quasimodo. These bikes are big beasted, especially the Boss Hoss. It's got a V8 in there now. How are you supposed to get that around town, eh? Not exactly nimble or practical, is it? They are practical bikes. Again, it depends what you have in mind to use them for. Um, in terms of running costs, you know, they're very cheap to run. Um, the servicing costs are to a minimal in comparison to some of certainly the Japanese manufacturers. Uh, for example, belt drive on the Harley Davidson would last probably four or five times longer than chain drive on a, uh, an imported motorcycle from Japan. They're big, they're loud, they're different. And if you don't mind Buell-induced backache and numerous recalls, then it's a fun alternative to a sports bike. As for the other big cruisers, if you fancy a burbling V-twin or a V8 for that matter and cost is no object, then treat yourself. You can guarantee that no one else in your vicinity is going to have one. They are attention seeker specials. So you've ridden loads of motorbikes and now you decide you really want something very, very different. But where to begin? Well, after lots of soul searching and head scratching, you might decide that perhaps a BMW could be the answer. So you take a trip to your local BMW dealership and you come across one of these, an R1200C. How much more different would you like to get? There is not another bike on the planet that looks like this, but is it any good? Well, before you ride it anywhere, you're gonna notice that it is very well equipped. After all, this is a BMW, which means a host of lovely little touches. These extend all the way from what is perhaps the best toolkit on any motorcycle to be found under the seat, the decent pillion perch with a nice well, all the way through to the heated grips which are an absolute godsend in this climate. Admittedly this bike is a cruiser so it's never supposed to be the fastest thing on the planet but it is surprising that given that that motor is the biggest incarnation of the Boxer Twin that BMW do at 1200cc, that it can have so little character and also be so slow. It'll get you up to 70 odd mile an hour easily enough, but there's no real character to the experience of getting there. 
As for the rest of it, the fuel link really isn't all that smart, snatching on and off the throttle and making cruising around, even at slow speeds, a bit of a pain. And the gearbox, although it is positive enough, does require a firm boot. Another area on the R1200C that's less than perfect are the brakes. They may have snazzy Brembo logos on them, but to be honest, adequate is the best they can be described as. As you can guess by now, I'm really not the biggest fan of this bike. I admire what BMW have tried to do with being so different, but to be honest, I don't reckon they got it right this time. This is simply not a very nice motorcycle to spend time with. It's not comfortable enough, no matter how well built it actually is. Anyway, how does it rack up in the scores? Styling, 8 out of 10. Got to be the bike's strong point. Love it or loathe it, you cannot ignore it. Performance, 5 out of 10. The handling is way up for a cruiser, but sadly that motor and those brakes are nothing better than average. Comfort, 3 out of 10. Oh dear. For a cruiser packing away some long straight miles, this really isn't a comfortable motorcycle. Sorry. Street cred, 5 out of 10. Again, it comes down to that styling. People will love it or hate it, but it's never going to be as cool as a Harley. Reliability, 9 out of 10. It's a BMW, it will go on forever and ever and ever. Value for money, 6 out of 10. I reckon you would really have to want one of these to actually part with hard cash to get one. Regardless of how you feel about any of this bike's other quirks or deficiencies, by far and away the worst part of the R1200C riding experience is the riding position. Grant is sat like I am now, it's really quite comfortable. This seat is very, very soft, even supports your back a little bit. And the pegs are in just the right place too. But the problem comes when you decide you want to go anywhere and you have to reach them bars because they're absolutely miles away. Go any more than five miles and you're gonna start feeling it across the tops of your shoulders. And if you fancy topping 60 mile an hour, you're probably gonna have to work out. Well, I'm afraid that brings us to the end of this episode of Bike File, but please do join us again next week when we're going to be back with a whole load of German motorcycles. <laughs>